In this webinar, we're joined by Craig Baker, who is Global Chief Investment Officer at Willis Towers Watson, and Stuart Gray, Portfolio Manager. Willis Towers Watson is a global company providing investment management, advice and solutions with more than £127 billion under management and a further £3.5 trillion under advice. Willis Towers Watson works with corporate pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds and wealth management companies and among their clients is one of Britain's oldest investment trusts, Alliance Trust, which invests in global equities on behalf of its shareholders, many of whom are ordinary private investors. Alliance Trust effectively outsources responsibility for the management of its underlying portfolio to a range of portfolio managers, all of whom are chosen by the team at Willis Towers Watson on the basis that they are the best at what they do, and some of whom are inaccessible to ordinary investors via any other means. Craig and Stuart spend their days choosing and monitoring this stable of stock picking managers who are based all around the world and invest in companies all around the world. With so much going on in the world at the moment, this is a great time to hear their views on global equities and how that's driving decisions at Alliance Trust. Uh, as Pascal mentioned, it's a multi-manager approach. So uh, it is 100% in public equities, um, truly global uh, approach uh, investing around the world, trying to be over the long term the MSCI All Country World Index. And it does that by finding who we think are the best stock pickers in the world and blending a number of those uh, together. Now, there are multi manager approaches out there in retail space. Um, we think this is actually very different from the others that are out there. And the reason is because it's a really high conviction approach. So what we've done is we've gone to who we think are the world's best stock pickers. And we've said to them, um, don't give us your standard product with um, 50, 100 stocks in it. Um, just give us your very best ideas. We've chosen you because we think you're uh, highly skilled in stock selection. We don't think you're good at uh, macro, calling macro factors, uh, taking big positions at a country level or an industry level. Just give us your very best ideas. Think about risk in terms of permanent loss of capital in that company you're investing in rather than risk relative to a benchmark or a peer group in the short term. <coughs> um, and what we then do is blend those really high conviction portfolios. So it's only their best ideas. So 10 to 20 stocks uh, is all we want from each of these stock pickers. And then we put those together. Um, they're each managed as segre segregated accounts purely for Alliance Trust. We combine those in a way that brings managers that think about the world differently. So we have the advantages of any other multi-manager approach in that it controls risk. You're not reliant on the skills of one individual. Um, you haven't just got uh, a bet on growth or on value or on large cap or on small cap or particular uh, types of sectors or themes in the portfolio. It's actually blending people that look at the world uh, very differently. So you get that risk control, but unlike a lot of multi-manager approaches where um, they end up being over diversified, um, we actually um, stop that and keep this as very high conviction. So even when you blend all of these managers together, we've still got active money or active share of 75%. So that means 75% um, of the portfolio looks completely different uh, to the benchmark, to put that in perspective. That's the kind of um, risk that you'd see in a single manager approach, but here it's focused entirely on stock selection, which is where we think we get the best uh, bang for buck um, that's out there for all the reasons that I talked about. Um, we're getting you access to uh, managers that otherwise aren't available in UK retail space in some cases, and even where they are available in UK retail space, you can't just get their best ideas portfolio, i.e. this 10 to 20 best ideas um, anywhere other than Fire Alliance Trust. And then we do that in a way that um, continues Alliance Trust's 55 year track record of increasing dividends every single year. Um, we do that um, with a, a real focus on sustainability or ESG factors and climate risk being a big one of those, as I mentioned before, there is a, a net zero pledge on the trust to get to net zero by 2050 with a halving of emissions by 2030. 
Um, and unlike most multi-manager approaches, we've been able to do that at very low cost. And that's really akin to um, those numbers I gave earlier where we advise on a few trillion uh, pounds of, um, uh, of assets. We have um, real ability to use that, um, uh, that size of assets to negotiate better fees with the managers that you're invested with. And so uh, you end up with uh, a trust that's actually lower uh, lower cost than a number of uh, single manager approaches, despite uh, all the advantage of the multi-manager approach. So that's the principle behind it. And really the reason we like this highly concentrated best ideas approach um, is set out here, which was a, a big academic paper that was done that showed that if you take all of the um, active equity managers that are out there um, and um, put them in deciles of how much risk they take relative to the benchmark. In other words, on the right hand side, you've got people that run these 10, 20 stock portfolios. On the left hand side, people that run um, quasi passive portfolios, very diversified portfolios. What you find is that those that run highly concentrated portfolios tend to outperform quite considerably over the long term. That's not picking who are the best managers, that's literally just saying, even if you um, just look at everyone that runs highly concentrated portfolios, they do well. We think we can do a lot better than that by picking the most skilled investors within that universe as well. Um, so that's the, the principle behind what we do. We don't want managers to give us stocks just for risk control purposes. We can do that in how we blend the managers together. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Stuart, who will um, talk you through what that's led to the portfolio looking like today um, so that um, he can put it in the context of current market movements. Great, thanks very much, Craig. So what I'm going to do um, is just try and walk through how we put this into practice. Um, so I've got a slide here on you know, a bit about our process, which we could probably spend a few hours on, and I'm going to try and do it in a couple of minutes. Um, but just to give you an idea of, of what this you know, really means in terms of our day job is we, we start off with finding those skilled stock pickers that Craig talked about. You know, we all know that most active managers underperform net of fees in the very long term. So whilst there's thousands of managers out there, picking you know, the really skilled and differentiated ones is difficult. So we're not just simply looking at past returns and trying to extrapolate. There's hundreds of hours of due diligence which goes into the first pillar of this, which is finding the skilled managers. And very simply, we're looking for people who have genuinely differentiated insights um, in either their idea generation, their financial analysis of companies, their understanding of these businesses, and, and how they pick businesses and build their portfolios. But as well as that, because we're looking for long-term investment returns, you know, we're looking for companies that are stable, that have strong investment-led cultures, that have good alignments of interest to, to us and yourselves as shareholders. You know, those environments create stability and they, they create the right place for people to make these long-term investment decisions. And it's much better than having a, a more chaotic environment or some, somewhere that's focused on short-term issues or where things are constantly changing. You know, that's, that's not a good environment for a manager to sit in. So those are the kinds of things we're looking for in the manager selection phase. Um, secondly, as Craig says, just finding the needle in the haystack, as in this, this fantastic manager, isn't enough in our view. You know, then we're doing the customization. We're trying to give them a mandate which maximizes the impact they're having from their stock selection. And I think in, in markets like today, this is really key. You know, we really understand who are the managers who are able to stand back from the noise of markets um, and all the volatility we're seeing today and pick out the best long-term investment opportunities for our investors. Um, the third pillar, of course, is portfolio construction. So once you've found the managers, customize their portfolios, how do you actually pick the managers that go into Alliance Trust? Uh, we've got about 20 or 25 managers uh, that we work with on these concentrated portfolios. Um, we tend to have around 10 in the Alliance Trust portfolio. So sort of eight to 12 is a typical range. And how we pick those is, is really on trying to maximize diversity. So obviously we have to pick the managers who we think are the best at what they do, um, but we're also trying to pick managers who think differently, find different ideas and bring the most diversity to the portfolio. And that's really important in markets like today, where the market's swinging so violently from one, 
one part of the market to the other in terms of what's driving returns. Having different ideas in different parts of the market gives you more stability in the portfolio, and that's really important. I'll talk more in a second about how we actually allocate capital to those managers. But the fourth pillar of what we do is, is the ongoing oversight. So once you've actually built the portfolio, you then need to maintain it through time because we all know the world changes and it's changing very rapidly now. So um, you definitely need to stay on top of the portfolio. Um, Craig, myself, Mark Davis, Maria Mizella, the, the team here is constantly looking at the portfolio and making adjustments to ensure that the total portfolio um, is you know, the right structure, has the right risk profile. Yeah, so the underlying stock pickers are just picking the stocks. Willis Towers Watson is looking at the total portfolio and making sure that it's sort of uh, best in class for the environment that we're in. And of course, when things need to change, we'll change the portfolio. Um, and if we need to change managers, we do that through time as well. Uh, very occasionally, but um, you know, we change managers as and when needed. Um, so let's just see, let's just move on to the next slide. Sorry about that on the slides. Um, this is how we allocate capital to, uh, to the managers. So like I said, we pick managers that are the best at what they do and are differentiated to each other. Um, but we don't give them equal amounts of capital. Even though we think they're all equally good, this is how we control the overall portfolio characteristics and portfolio risk. So you can see, for example, uh, GKG has got the most capital here. And that's because all nine of these managers in the portfolio today, um, they have their global concentrated portfolios. Em uh, GPG has an emerging market sleeve as well. So they've got about another 5% in emerging market stocks for us, which is why their allocation is a little bigger than the others. But even allowing for that, you can see that GPG, Veritas, uh, Black Creek, for example, have, have slightly higher weights. Uh, managers like Sands, Lyrical Partners have lower weights at the moment. Um, and that's partly because um, GKG, Veritas, you know, they are looking for larger cap companies, typically higher quality companies. These companies are typically a bit more stable. Um, SANS looks for very high growth businesses. Uh, Lyrical is looking for very deep value businesses. Um, they've been a lot more volatile, particularly in the current environment. So that's how we think about you know, the overall risk profile of the, of the Alliance Trust portfolio. Um, so clearly, when we've gone through a period like we've had a year to date, um, growth has, has had the obvious challenges, which people know about. Um, value stocks have been under pressure because of people concerned about recession. Um, and therefore, you know, some of the cyclicals in the value space have been under a lot of pressure as well. So there's a lot more risk in some of these types of companies in the current environment. So their weighting is a bit lower in the portfolio today. Now, clearly, in some years' time, you know, who knows where the world will be in five years' time, but when the world's different, these weightings will change. And that's Willis Towers Watson's job of adjusting the portfolio to make sure the risk is right for the environment that we're in. But again, a reminder that all of these managers are picking stocks for the long term, and that's the key driver of the portfolio. And, and this slide is, is almost a proof statement of that. Um, so the key here is in the top right corner. And as Craig said earlier, the active money or active share of the portfolio is very high. And what this is saying is that the risk in the portfolio is coming from the stocks being completely different to the benchmark. Um, and as Craig described, we're not trying to take very heroic macro or top-down views on, should I buy US tech today? Should I buy European cyclicals because they're very cheap today? So you can see on the left-hand side, we've got uh, sectors. In the middle, we've got geography. And you can see the portfolio exposure in purple versus the benchmark in yellow. And, and of course, we're not exactly the same as the benchmark. You know, we, there's no need to constrain ourselves to be identical to the benchmark. Um, but you know, those allocations compared to the benchmark are pretty similar. Hence, we're not taking those huge risks on those types of factors. And on the right-hand side, you can see style tilts. So this is showing, is our portfolio, is the Alliance Trust portfolio cheaper than the market or more expensive? Is it growing faster than the market or growing less fast? And the key here is that most of these numbers are about zero. Um, if you had a, a value manager, for example, you'd see bars, you know, very big bars of like plus one, plus two, um, whereas ours are sort of 0.1 and 0.2. So again, it's just showing you that 
we're not taking these big style risks or big geography risks, etc. Um, it's important to say that you know, the stock picking does drive the positioning. So whilst these all these risks are small, they, they do evolve. So if you look to the portfolio a couple of years ago, we probably wouldn't own very much at all in the energy and commodity spaces because they weren't particularly attractive at the time. But as they started to become you know, very attractive relative to sort of the more expensive growth stocks, you saw our portfolio exposures changing a little bit. So we own more in energy today than we did a couple of years ago. And that, of course, has been very beneficial for performance. So, you know, it's that stock selection coming from the stock pickers that really drives, you know, the alpha through time from the portfolio. And Willis tells Watch is just making sure that the total portfolio has the right characteristics at the top level. Just to give you a quick idea from a bottom-up perspective um, of why we think the portfolio is so different, these are the top active positions, i.e. relative to the benchmark. Um, usually we show the top 10, but here, here we've got 10 that we own and two that we don't own. So we don't own any Apple and Tesla in the portfolio uh, at the end of August, this is. Um, so clearly, if the managers don't think that Apple is an attractive investment, we're just not going to own it. It doesn't matter that it's a very large part of the benchmark. And you can see, of course, that Visa, Alphabet, quite a few of the stock pickers think that that's a good idea. So we're happy to be very selective about owning Visa and Alphabet, not owning Apple. That's the stock selection really coming through. What we get asked a lot, of course, is overlap. What happens if all of these stock pickers just buy the same company? And clearly, you can see with Alphabet and Visa, that happens occasionally, very occasionally. But also, you can see there's four stocks in the top 10, over, uh, top 10 active positions where it's only one manager, one stock picker that owns them. So there really isn't a lot of overlap in this portfolio. And, th and that's the key message, that there is a lot of diversity, very little overlap. And the last point on this slide, it, just to give you an idea about the breadth of idea generation, um, whilst Visa and Alphabet are pretty household names, I imagine you know, Petrobras, Bureau Veritas, DBS Banking, Singapore, you know, these are less common holdings and probably not the ones you typically see in most people's top tens uh, if you're looking at standard global equity products. So, you know, lots of good idea generation, different types of ideas from around the world. And of course, just very quickly, I'll give you an idea of different, um, different types of stocks. So Visa, for example, is a reasonably good inflation hedge to some degree because Visa just takes a, a percentage cut of the goods sold on its platform, essentially. So when the price of goods goes up with inflation, Visa's percentage take of it goes up as well. So it has a sort of a direct inflationary link to its revenues um, to some degree. Um, then you've got something like, uh, well, let's say IPG is a, a media business or um, you know, Salesforce, for example. You know, some of these are more cyclical businesses or higher growth businesses, which have been, you know, have a slightly opposite impact from, from interest rates and inflation that we've seen. Um, then you've got something like Mercado Libre, which is just you know, a growth stock. It's a bit like the Amazon of Latin America. So e-commerce and growth. Um, we all know what's going on in the growth space, but we still think it's a good long-term investment opportunity. And then you've got something like a Bureau Veritas, which is uh, really a, um, a testing calibration type business. Um, it's a very, very stable, more um, resilient type profile of a company with a very long duration of stable growth because the demand for testing and accuracy in the industrial space is only going up. Um, so it's got a very stable uh, cash flow stream, more resilient type of business. So a real mix there of inflation hedges, um, more pressured by inflation or cyclical and more stable companies, even just in the top 10 of the portfolio. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to move on quickly. I should hand back to Craig to talk a bit more about performance. So just very quickly, um, with all that's going on in the world, we are very confident in the companies that we own. Whilst there's a, a great mix of businesses there, if you look at the long term, they're fundamentally very strong companies that are very attractively priced today. Um, and whilst most portfolios you might have to trade off some of these characteristics. If you want a higher growth portfolio, it's normally more expensive. If you've got a cheap portfolio, it normally has less growth or lower quality. 
Um, the Alliance Trust portfolio today is, is quite unusual, even for us, which is it, it actually looks quite attractive across lots of these different metrics. And that just speaks to the fundamental strength of the companies in the portfolio today and, and the opportunity ahead um, for our investors. So with that, I'm just going to hand back to Craig to talk uh, a little bit more about performance um, and our outlook from here. Uh, Craig, I think you're still on mute. Had to happen. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so the obvious question uh, is how this has ended up uh, resulting in performance uh, since we've been running the portfolio and uh, more recently. Uh, and so what we've done here is shown uh, the performance of the trust on various bases against its main benchmark. And so when uh, I mean, I mentioned this up front, but when Stuart was talking through uh, what the portfolio looks like relative to the benchmark, that is that MSCI All Country World Index. That's the um, uh, taking all of the stocks uh, in the world uh, on a market cap basis, the most traditional uh, index that's used, including developed and emerging markets. Um, and uh, that's the index that we think over the long term will be able to comfortably uh, outperform. And what we've shown in the first three rows of the top table um, is uh, various ways of looking at the returns on the trust, so the total shareholder return, the NAV total return, and then the, the, the measure there of NAV excluding non-core assets. So the background here is that the, the trust, when we took it on, had a number of legacy assets in there. It owned Alliance Trust Savings, had some real estate, private equity, mineral rights in there. Uh, and so we also show this line, which is how this multi-manager equity approach that has been 100% of the portfolio uh, for the last two and a half years, uh, but was uh, in the 90s uh, of percent of the portfolio for the first uh, year or two uh, of operation. And so that's the, the cleaner number to look at how this approach has done. And you'll see that, you know, over the last five and a half years, very strong absolute returns. 9% uh, uh, per annum uh, over that period. Um, but relative to uh, the benchmark, the MSCI All Country World Index, um, that's a slight underperformance uh, over that period, slight outperformance uh, this year, slight underperformance since inception. Um, but what we also show in the table at the bottom is the relative returns, not just against that benchmark, but some other ways uh, of looking at it. And the reason for that is that it's important to put context around this. Five years sounds like a long period of time, and often it is because that's a full market cycle. We haven't had a full market cycle over this period. Uh, as we mentioned, for virtually all of that period, um, equities were just going up uh, in a straight line. Interest rates were coming down and growth stocks were outperforming everything. And actually, mega cap was outperforming everything. Um, uh, about 50% uh, of the return on the US stock market was from five companies in 2021, for example. And so what you actually found is that the MSCI All Country World Index has been about the best performing portfolio uh, out there. Um, those mega cap uh, tech companies driving almost all of its performance. And so virtually every active management uh, approach has struggled over that period of time, that's starting to, to change at the moment, but certainly over that full five, five and a half years. And Alliance Trust was um, was no different in some ways in that it kind of only just about kept in line with the MSCI or Country World Index. But when you look at how it did relative to other managers, the, uh, the, the global sector average, the other global equity investment trusts, uh, two and a half percent per annum, outperformance over that full period, nearly 10% outperformance uh, this year. Uh, and relative to just an equal weighted version of that MSI All Country World Index, which strips out this fact that mega cap uh, has driven everything, um, you see very significant outperformance as well. So um, it's done very well relative to the peer group, not quite so well um, as we would hope over the long term against the MSCI All Country World Index. Uh, because of the dynamics of that being so concentrated uh, to five or six companies. Um, if we then uh, flip on, though, the obvious question is, OK, but have you done over a much longer time period? And this is 
when I refer to the fact that we've been doing this in institutional space for a long, long time. And the whole idea of Alliance Trust was bringing some of the best things that are done in institutional space to the retail market for the first time. Uh, this is our longer track record of doing this, which stretches back to about um, uh, 2008, so about 14 years. And you can see outperformance of some 4% per annum of the MSCI All Country World Index if you go back uh, a long enough period, uh, but that tougher period uh, over the most recent uh, few years. So the obvious question is, OK, but why are you confident that it's going to perform well going forwards? And I think this slide brings that to life and actually pulls out a lot of the discussions we were having uh, with what's been driving markets uh, over the last five years uh, and why we're so confident about a bottom up um, stock driven uh, portfolio today. So what we did is we took the five years to the end of March 2022. And we said, how much of the return um, on our portfolio and then how much of the return on the MSCI All Country World Index to each of them, how much of the return came from fundamental growth of the companies you're investing in? So in other words, if you just bought the entire company, forget the fact that you're buying shares in the company, if you just bought the companies that we own, um, how would you have done uh, in terms of whether those companies were growing uh, and uh, beating expectations uh, and producing profits and hence uh, dividends uh, and earnings per share growth. That's the purple bit. And then how much just came from the fact that the companies weren't really doing anything um, well, but the market just suddenly started to like that area of the market more or less. And so that's really the multiple expansion. So in other words, the price earnings uh, multiple uh, on a particular company just got bigger or smaller. And that's the brown piece. And what you see is that almost all of the return from our portfolio came from the fact that our um, managers were doing exactly what you would hope. They were finding businesses that were performing incredibly well as a business and better than expectations and were producing good profits uh, and earnings and dividends. And very little of the return actually came from just the fact that uh, multiples were expanding. Whereas if you actually look at what happened on the index, uh, despite the fact that the index performed incredibly well, what you'll see is that most of that actually came from just multiple expansion. So in other words, um, a lot of these big cap tech companies um, were just getting more and more expensive. Uh, their price earnings multiples were expanding. So what is the obvious question? Well, the so what is the chart on the right hand side that shows you over the long term, um, that brown piece will roughly equal zero. Um, multiples will expand, contract, but ultimately the average price earnings ratio uh, on the equity market will stay the same over the very long term. Uh, and actually it's about the growth in the fundamentals of the businesses you're investing in that lead to share price uh, appreciation. And that's what that chart on the right hand side shows is the true uh, outcome over the very long term. So we sit here with a portfolio that's doing exactly what we would hope in terms of the businesses we're investing in. And that just hasn't necessarily been fully reflected in prices yet. We're very confident that that will be the case uh, over the long term. And this links into this idea of, well, do you want to be value growth? Um, do you want to take some big bets on countries? And that we don't think you need to do any of those things. In fact, um, a lot of people are talking about this move from growth to value. Actually, it's been a move from technology uh, to energy. A lot of value managers, um, despite their label, have struggled still in 2022, despite the fact that things have done well because they've had nothing in energy. Uh, and similarly, um, some growth start, uh, uh, managers have done okay because they haven't actually necessarily been as much in technology. And so uh, it's really understanding the dynamics of the companies that you're investing in. And this gives us a lot of confidence uh, going forward. And we think investing in a portfolio that hasn't got a big strong bias uh, to style, um, but has actually invested in some really high quality businesses uh, is the way forward. So at that point, um, we'll stop.
and we'll open it up to Q&A. Hello, guys. Um, OK, so we've got plenty of questions to ask. Um, we'll start with a pretty simple one, which is how important is it to you when you're looking at a potential um, fund manager to work with to, to look at the amount of money they themselves have invested in the, in the portfolio the portfolios that they run? Stu, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, very important. Um, we look at alignments of interest. It's one of the things I talked about in that process slide, um, which very much involves them having in money invested alongside clients um, and their investors. Uh, but it encompasses other things as well in terms of how, you know, do they own shares in the asset management business in which they work? Um, you know, how they align through other compensation, other incentives, um, and all sorts of other motivational things which go into um, what, what keeps them there doing what they do. Um, but yes, definitely look at how much money they've got and skin in the game. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a few questions about um, the economic environment, and obviously there's an awful lot going on there, so one would expect that. Um, but just start with the first. Do you think a continued retreat of loose monetary policy will continue to reward fundamental investors like yourselves? Yes. Yeah, so um, we, in the long term, absolutely, we think fundamentals will out in in the companies. Now, um, clearly, um, there are periods where big macro events are taking place, and actually, fundamentals aren't what's driving share prices in that particular point in time. Now, normally, those are quite short lived, and so you, know, you can look at something like. Um, what happened with um, the lockdown through COVID, you can have a look at big interest rate movements uh, and the like, and those can decouple fundamentals from what's driving the market at that particular point in time. It's unusual for that to last very long, um, but we certainly did see a period um, uh, through uh, to, uh, sort of the last three or four years until the end of 2021 whereby fundamentals didn't appear to be driving markets for some time. Uh, and that can happen. Uh, but that ultimately, as the chart shows on the right hand side here of the slide that's that's still up, um, that just isn't the case over the long term. The fundamentals of businesses have to be what will drive the share price. And so that's why we're so confident that um, over the next few years, um, not only can this um, outperform as we would expect over the long term, but it could actually have some very strong outperformance uh, reflecting the catch up of some of that fundamentals not being uh, reflected in prices over the last few years. Thank you. Um, and there's some questions about uh, obviously what's going on in the UK. There's a huge amount of turbulence uh, this week and last. Um, would you consider reducing your UK overweight uh, given the turbulence now? Uh, sort of affecting the UK equities. Yeah, it's firstly uh, important to say that um, obviously the, the the UK overweight takes into account where the particular companies are listed. A number of those UK companies are completely global companies that just happen to be listed in the UK. And so when you actually uh, look at it, the amount of actual exposure we have to very domestic UK companies that are 100% st sterling based is actually pretty small uh, and, and not actually much more than the index at all. Um, so it can be um, uh, somewhat confusing at looking at that. That's just where those companies are listed. But uh, I don't know, Stuart, if you wanted to add anything else on that. I mean, no, other than to say that you know the stock pickers are, are very aware of what's happening in markets and and the opportunities that's creating as well as the challenges and you know, so what we're doing is not trying to make a, a macro call on the portfolio per se um we're challenging the managers we're talking to the stock pickers about their companies and and you know what they're seeing from a stock perspective so most of this should be done by the stock pickers um you know, we do look at the risk profile of the total fund, as Craig talked about, and we, we can make adjustments if we need to, but primarily it's making sure the stock pickers are aware of what's going on with the companies and, and who's benefiting from, from what's going on right now. It's also worth just noting that um, you can have a, a situation where um, the economics of a particular country are unattractive, but the stock market in that country does very well. Um, and so the thing you have to bear in mind is how much of those poor economic conditions have already been priced into the stocks. 
Uh, and, you know, a number of the, the, the stock pickers we've got would be saying that a number of these UK stocks look very cheap. Um, and on a long term basis, sterling looks relatively cheap as well. And so actually um, some of those UK stocks can look pretty attractive. Brilliant. Um, we've got a question about valuations in the US, which I'll come back to. But I'm just sticking with this kind of UK turbulence thing. Do, do managers, uh, uh, do you guys have a mandate to pay attention to foreign exchange and kind of currency issues? And, and does that affect how you think about structuring the, the, the weightings in the portfolio? Um, and given the relative strength of the dollar uh, for sterling investors now, does that have any impact on the way you think? Yeah, so just to be clear, both the benchmark and the portfolio is unhedged. Um, and so um, clearly this portfolio has more exposure to uh, the dollar than uh, the US dollar than any other currency because the US is uh, approximately 55% of the portfolio, uh, something like that. So the portfolio has actually benefited from falling sterling uh, over the course of the last uh, few years. Mm -hmm. um, quite an interesting question about the way the portfolio works. You, you said earlier, uh, you were talking earlier about the fact that the the stock pickers pretty much have free reign to do what they like. It's their best ideas. Um, is there a danger? Um, the question is uh, that in a scenario where um, a recession is kind of affecting the world, those stock pickers all crowd into the same areas. Yeah. So I mean, we we definitely get asked this a lot, and I, I would say simply yes, there is a danger of that if we've picked managers who really don't think differently. Um, and do end up doing similar things. And if we don't spot that at the portfolio level, then the portfolio starts to get crowded. But the reality is, is very different to that. Um, we know these managers in very granular detail and their philosophies are very, very different. And the likelihood of them actually crowding into the same space is extremely low. And that's been our experience over long periods of time. Nevertheless, we will still monitor it. And if it, if it happens, we will do something about it. We can change their allocations and we can change managers if we need to. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just important to, re to remember these are separate accounts that are run purely for us. And so we have complete transparency um, at any point in time as to what the portfolio looks like. And so we can make those changes as and when appropriate. But as Stuart said, it doesn't actually happen. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from one of our analysts here. This is the valuations question I was talking about. Um, uh, they were talking to a US fund manager who was saying that um, the US equities haven't yet priced in a recession. Um, is that uh, your, do you feel the same? Do you think that's the truth? Um, and if, is there a recession in the pipe for the US? Uh, and if so, um, are you uh, or are you seeing managers rotate out of US equities? Yeah, so as a general point, um, it's fair to say that equity markets have. Um, have certainly reflected uh, changing expectations for interest rates and inflation uh, in pricing. But, um, but what they haven't done is suddenly reflected a significant probability of a bad recession. Um, so um, if you got a very mild recession, that wouldn't necessarily mean that um, pricing's wrong. But if you got a, a hard landing in the US, then yes, it's likely that would have uh, a negative impact on equity returns for a, for a period of time. Um, it's not currently our expectation that, um, that that will happen. We're cautious on equities, but we're not outright negative on uh, equities given current valuations. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else on that, Stuart. No, other than it's a very good question, obviously, and we debate it a lot. Um, I would just say having a broad view of the market overall is different to having a specific view on some specific companies. Um, so when we talk to Lyrical, for example, who looks at US value stocks, you know, they're looking at very, very cheap companies where you know, they think there's an awful lot of pessimism priced into that company in terms of its earnings outlook. So I think from a bottom-up perspective, you can find opportunities where um, you know, bad news is um, I would say adequately priced in at this point. 
looking at the market as a whole, you might take a different picture. So again, it's, it's kind of marrying this idea about top-down risk versus bottom-up stock selection. Thank you, guys. Um, moving on to uh, a slightly less topical uh, in the immediate term, but something that's been very topical during the last year or so, um, about ESG. Uh, in a previous presentation that you've um, shown uh, to our audience, you showed the timeline of ESG implementations, um, things like the exclusion of thermal coal and tar sand companies. Um, what do you see to be the next implementation? Um, and has uh, kind of a changing attitude to ESG as a result of the energy crisis and war in Europe and all that stuff, um, not to diminish it at all, but, uh, you know, have, have those factors uh, affected your, your plan uh, and your, the, the sort of timeline of that plan? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very topical, actually, in terms of uh, some of the backlash on ESG that, that's out there. I think it's important to reflect the difference between um, your long-term view of where the portfolio is headed versus what short-term fluctuations will be. So when we um, uh, announced the, the pledge to get the portfolio to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and a halving by 2030, we were very clear at the time that that doesn't mean we want to always be ahead of that trajectory. There'll be times where it makes financial sense to be behind that trajectory. And actually, um, this year has been a classic example of that. And so um, our portfolio has been very underweight um, energy, for example, for a while um, and uh, had much lower um, emissions than the index, for example. And then in 2022, um, the portfolio has been overweight energy, which has actually been very beneficial performance wise. And so in the short term, our emissions are slightly higher than uh, the index. Um, that doesn't diminish from the fact that we're spending a lot of time on um, uh, engaging with the companies that we're investing in. And each of those companies are then getting their emissions down and are on a pathway to towards net zero themselves. And so you've got two parts to this. You know, One is what's happening in the emissions of the companies you hold at any point in time. And one is how much you're trading the portfolio from one sector to another, which will have a short term influence. Um, we think the former is the most important because in the long term, it's getting the entire economy towards a net zero uh, situation that's important. And so, um, no, nothing has changed in terms of uh, the way we look at the portfolio because we've been consistent with what we said at outset. The big um, you know, next thing that you talked about is just an improvement in the kind of metrics people are looking at on a portfolio. And so we will be looking at not just how the emissions on the portfolio are changing, it's how the emissions in each of the underlying companies are changing, whether each company is being consistent with what they've said they're going to do and with uh, what the Paris uh, Agreement is, how that's likely to have an impact on the financial risk of that individual company. And so we can actually calculate uh, the value at risk of each of the companies uh, if there was a transition to a net zero world overnight. Uh, what would that do to the share price of each of the companies? And we use that to challenge the underlying stock pickers on why they're owning particular stocks. But that doesn't stop us owning stocks that have got high uh, carbon emissions. Indeed, there are some stocks that have got high carbon emissions in the portfolio that are a long way ahead of others in their sector uh, in terms of uh, improving their emissions over time and actually being a solution to the rest of the industry in many cases. Thank you. Uh, final question, but one. Um, and probably the final question really is, given the uh, relatively strong performance seen so far this year and the increased dividend 2021, um, are you optimistic around the sustainability of the dividend uh, for this year, especially given the potentially tougher times we have ahead? So simple answer is yes. Uh, I mean, that's that's one of the big advantages of Alliance Trust um, in that it's got very significant reserves. And the whole idea of reserves is such that you can smooth out um, any issues if there are periods where um, uh, the, the dividends being paid out by companies for whatever reason are 
lower than the amount that you want to pay out that particular year. Um, but suffice to say that when um, the board made the decision to increase the dividend, a huge amount of work was done on all the scenarios that could play out um, and um, how much they wanted to increase that dividend such that they were absolutely confident uh, that there were no issues with being able to uh, sustain that um, that increasing dividend every year for many years to come. Uh, and so, yes, we're very confident in that. Brilliant. Uh, there was one other question um, which we should address. Uh, I think we'll address after the uh, show is over, but it's just about the index being used on some of the slides. I think the index across the whole presentation has been the MSCI All Companies World Index. Correct. Um, yes, exactly the same for, for every um, time we've shown the benchmark. It's, it's that index. Great. Okay. In that case, that the question is answered. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us, uh, Craig and Stuart. Um, it's been really fascinating, and I hope the audience has found it uh, as interesting as I have. And thank you, everybody who has been here this morning. Um, that's all we've got time for. Um, have a great day. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.